Hello and welcome to our video summarising everything you need to know when it comes to women's suffrage and how both the suffragettes and the suffragists helped women in England manage to get the vote and equal voting rights as men. My name is Barbara and in this video I'll go over the key difference between the suffragettes and the suffragists but most importantly I will walk you through a really useful timeline in understanding the long road that women took in Britain in order to secure equal voting rights as men. So let's begin. Now, always remember that life in Victorian and Edwardian England was fairly challenging for women during this time because they had few rights. Do bear in mind that the Victorian England period covers Queen Victoria's reign between 1837 to 1901 and Edwardian England, this is King Edward who followed Queen Victoria, lasted between 1901 to 1910. Now this period was a vastly different time for England where women really had very few rights, especially once they were married. Indeed, once they were married, women became the property of their husbands and a remnant of this actually can be seen today with married women taking the husband's surname, never the other way around. Indeed, women during this time was the weaker sex. Another traditional notion is that of the dowry. This actually stems from a similar idea that women are seen as the properties of their father and thus sold on as property of their husbands and thus the husband pays a dowry, in other words, a price tag in order to get the woman's hand in marriage. All of these contribute to the notion during Victorian and Edwardian England where women were seen as the weaker sex. Now, of course, the journey to women's suffrage really was a result of the protests of many women, as well as the support of some key male figures in society and especially parliament, which led things to gradually start to change for women. And do bear in mind that this was a very slow process, but real change did begin happening, especially during the latter part of the Victorian period. And this eventually led to women gaining the right to vote. Now, to really understand this journey and this entire process, it would be really good to really consider it in terms of a linear timeline. And of course, within this timeline, you will see how the suffragists and the suffragists evolved and the key difference between the suffragists and the suffragette movements. Now, when it comes to women's suffrage, really a key date to begin with is 1866. This was when a group of women organized a petition that demanded that women should have the same political rights as men. Now, during this time, they tried to get two MPs in particular, Henry Fawcett, who was the husband of Millicent Fawcett, and John Stuart Mill, who both worked in Parliament, to influence the second reform bill in order to get a few more equal rights for women. However, this was rejected. Now, the second reform bill, which was passed in 1867, actually increased the number of men who could vote. And indeed, the men that could vote under the second reform bill had to show that they owned £10 worth of property in their lodgings. Now, in 1870, there was the Married Women's Property Act that was passed, and this gave married women the right to own their own property and their money. So they no longer were seen solely as the property and the money of their husbands. They had a bit more freedom and autonomy over their own property. Now, do bear in mind, well before women gained the vote to uh, the right to vote in England as a whole, interestingly, the Isle of Man, which is a tiny small island in England, actually gave women the right to vote in 1881, so they were well ahead of their curve. Now, in 1884, the Representation of the People Act was passed, which gave more men the power to vote. However, women couldn't vote, but also bear in mind that not all men under this act could vote. Actually, 40% of men, the poorest of men in society, didn't still have the right to vote. Now, in steps in the suffragists. So in 1897, this is when the suffragists were born. Now, women were really upset with the second reform bill and the fact that they were ignored in their petition. So they set up the London Society for Women's Suffrage. Also, 17 women's groups ended up joining up to form the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, which is known by the acronym NUSS, which is a suffragist acronym, and it was led by Millicent Fawcett. So bear in mind that she was married to Henry Fawcett. Now, the NUWSS adopted a peaceful approach, achieving change through Parliament. So, in 1870 to 1884, there were lots of debates in Parliament about women's voting, and some people, however, felt this was too much talking and not enough action. Also do bear in mind that most NUWSS 
members were middle or upper class women who campaigned for property owning women, not necessarily campaigning for representation of working class women. This therefore led some women, especially notably Emmeline Pankhurst, to feel that they were not as represented by the suffragists and Emmeline Pankhurst, along with her daughters in 1903, formed the Suffragettes. And this was known as the Women's Social Political Union under the acronym WSPU. Now, they favoured taking a far more militant approach, therefore they used a lot of militant actions such as sabotaging communication lines, having arson attacks, letting off bombs, demonstrating and disrupting public meetings and, most importantly, their suffragists involved far more working class women. Now, 1905, the suffragettes also came up with a really important slogan, deeds, meaning actions, not words. So their slogan was deeds, not words, and they adopted very aggressive tactics. So between 1900 and 1914, around a thousand women were arrested as a result of the very violent, aggressive tactics and put in prison. And bear in mind that the, Brits, the government didn't treat them as political prisoners. They were treated like common criminals in prison. Now, in 1907, there was a split that occurred within the suffragettes and the Women's Freedom League, known as the WFL, was formed. Now, this split happened because the women that formed the WFL were really unhappy with the violence of the suffragettes and they favoured instead more peaceful law-breaking, such as demonstrations, not, for example, counting themselves as part of the country's census and refusing to pay taxes. In 1910, there were the Women's Anti-Suffrage League, which merged with the Men's National League for Opposing Women's Suffrage. And this is really important because this highlights that not all women supported the notion of voting and not all women saw voting as an important idea. In fact, they saw this as perhaps breaking with the traditional view of the woman who should be at home looking after children. So the Women's Anti-Suffrage League, which merged with the Men's National League for Opposing Women's Suffrage, actually had 42,000 members who were against women's votes. Now, also in 1910, a law called the Conciliation Bill was introduced and it supported many suffragists and suffragettes. Therefore, this law would, if it was passed, give the vote to a limited number of women with property and wealth. However, it was rejected by Lloyd George and Winston Churchill as it didn't include working class women. However, some suffragists and suffragettes actually saw this as an excuse by Lloyd George and Winston Churchill to just defer and put off giving the women vote by using the idea that not enough working class women were represented as a convenient excuse. Now, this bill, so the Conciliation Bill, was reintroduced again in 1911 and the Prime Minister at the time, called Asquith, pledged to make the bill a law in 1912. However, in 1913, he changed his position and this law never became a bill. Now, in 1913, two key events happened. Firstly, there was the Cat and Mouse Act, which was introduced officially, legally known as the Prisoners Temporary Discharge for Ill Health Act. And what this law said was that suffragettes, especially who went on hunger strikes in prison after being imprisoned but for their violent actions, were sometimes released and then found and rearrested once they went back home, ate, became healthy because the government didn't want to make martyrs of them. They didn't want them to die in prison. Now, another key thing that happened in 1913 is Emily Davidson, who was a suffragette, essentially tried to dis disrupt the derby, but she ended up dying after being trampled on by the king's horse. And this was seen, again, as a really big uh, loss for the suffragettes. And of course, also a lot of people who saw this, saw this as a huge disruption. And this, to some degree for some, was seen as losing the support of the suffragettes because there was too much disruption by women. Now, of course, in 1914, the major event that happened was the start of the First World War. And as a result of this World War, both suffragettes and suffragettes did call off their campaigns to support the war efforts. However, during the war, uh, there were a lot of women who really supported the war effort. So firstly, the Women's Land Army employed over 260,000 women as farm labourers in helping the war effort. Do bear in mind, of course, that a lot of farmers and a lot of people, a lot of men were called to war. And therefore, there were a lot of farms which were left unmanned and women took over. There are also many munitions women, so many women who went to work in factories and as a result actually a lot of them ended up suffering ill health from the chemicals with which they worked to make ammunition because they were overexposed to things like TNT which gave them yellow coloured skin. So of course this shows also the sacrifices that women made in order to help Britain win the First World War. 
Now, by 1917, it's estimated that women produced around 80% of all munitions. Also in transport, women worked as conductresses, drivers on buses, trams and underground trains. And between 1914 and 1918, this is the start and the end of the First World War, two million women replaced men in employment. Do bear in mind, of course, the men they replaced were the men who ended up serving at war as soldiers. And this, of course, this replacement resulted in an increase in the number of women in total employment from 24% of women in July 1914 to 37% by November 1918 by the end of the war. Now, of course, by 1918, the First World War ended and the representation of the People Act ended up being passed and this allowed women over the age of 30 with five pounds worth of property to vote and that therefore meant two-thirds of women UK population ended up being able to vote. Also of course this representation of the People Act was extended to men who were excluded from previous privileges so it let men over 21 or 19 if they'd served in the army vote and women with voting rights however according to this law which made it a limited law were really mainly upper class so in other words women who had over five pounds worth of property this restricted the women who could vote to mainly upper class women and of course these upper class women were over 30 years old now the women who got the vote and this is a major criticism of this act these women who were upper class mainly weren't necessarily the women who ended up working in war and especially serving in helping the war effort do bear in mind that it was in 1928, 10 years later, that women ended up getting the same voting rights as men. So that's all. If you found this video useful, do give it a thumbs up. However, if you didn't need any more information in order to support your studies of this area of history, do make sure you visit our website, which is www.firstreetutors.com. Thank you so much for listening.